DNC headquarters was to get information on the campaign activities of Democrat nominee George McGovern, Nixon's supporters needn't have worried. The Republican incumbent won by a landslide. Still, persistent questions remained about the break-in. And Democrats, as well as the American media, would not let the story go. In the spring of 1973, in the aftermath of these break-ins, there was an expose piece written for the Washington Post by Woodward and Bernstein. And this piece revealed the possibility of there having been a presidential cover-up associated with the Watergate break-ins. On May 17th, 1973, the Democrat-controlled Senate began hearings to investigate the break-in. And soon, the focus boiled down to one crucial question. What did the president know and when did he know it? What did the president know and when did the president know it? And it's since then become the key question that investigators have asked in every presidential scandal ever since. That phrase comes from a Republican senator, Howard Baker. And that question was actually fed to him by his counsel, Fred Thompson, later also a United States senator. And the notion was, look, the buck stops with the president. When it was revealed during the hearings that Nixon had recorded nearly all of his conversations in the Oval Office, the Senate and the media began a feeding frenzy for information. Did Richard Nixon order the plumbers to break in to the DNC headquarters? Or, if not, did he orchestrate a cover-up in an effort to protect his re-election campaign? Let me just say, these tapes cover a lot more than just Watergate. They revealed a lot about what Nixon knew and when he knew it, about all sorts of sordid and illegal and unethical foreign policy operations. His discussions with Henry Kissinger about operations in Chile and the U.S. role in overthrowing a democratically elected government there. There are tapes about Cambodia and Laos. There are discussions about the illegal wiretapping that they were doing. The list that Richard Nixon had uh, someone make on the number of Jews that worked in his government, for example. All this is being verbalized with people sitting there, and they had no idea it's being tape recorded. The tapes themselves serve as a truth serum, if you will, for history on what Richard Nixon's presidency was all about. In the decades since the Watergate scandal, numerous conspiracy theories continue to circulate as to Richard Nixon's numerous secret activities. One of Richard Nixon's cover-ups was his relationship with uh, B.B. Rebozo, who befriended Nixon uh, in the 1950s. He was the guy who contacted mafia figures on uh, Nixon's behalf, made deals. Rebozo served as the middleman in uh, several dealings with Howard Hughes. One example, a bribe from Howard Hughes to Nixon's brother Donald of $205,000 to set up a chain of hamburger stands. A friend of Howard Hughes tells me that the money actually went directly to Richard Nixon for his personal use. Watergate, in its narrowest sense, was just the break-in of the Democratic headquarters at the Watergate complex. They wanted to get into Larry O'Brien's office. O'Brien was the chair of the Democratic Party. And they thought that Larry O'Brien, who had business ties with Howard Hughes, might have the dope on what Nixon and Nixon's brother were getting from Howard Hughes. The Watergate break-in and the attempt to cover it up ultimately led to Richard Nixon's resignation as President of the United States. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. This is a cover-up of a crime that brought down the President of the United States, led to the resignation of a President of the United States, and it reverberates 
continually uh, through the history of presidents thereafter and, and to our, our current day. The roots of Watergate can be found in the personality and the character of Richard Nixon. And when he got into power, uh, he didn't have the kinds of constraints that most of us would have. He thought that politics was war, and he thought that political adversaries were enemies out to get him. But if the Watergate scandal was simply a consequence of Richard Nixon's personal paranoia, is it safe to say that political espionage and so-called dirty tricks are now a thing of the past? If there was an American book of secrets and you turned to the pages of Watergate, I think you would be very disappointed. I think what you would find is this president got caught and subsequent White Houses became much more sophisticated, but not much changed. And I can tell you personally of incidents where spy organizations were run in an opponent's political campaign long after Watergate, uh, infiltrating the opposition. It still goes on. Coming up. It involved the creation of a rogue agency. He negotiated and then sold arms to terrorists. Either one of those things were crimes that could have led to Ronald Reagan's impeachment. Abbottabad, Pakistan. May 2nd, 2011. Shortly after 1 a.m. local time, Osama bin Laden, the founder of Al-Qaeda and mastermind behind the deadliest terrorist attack ever on U.S. soil, is killed during a raid on his compound. The raid is the result of a top-secret mission called Operation Neptune Spear. Tonight, I can report to the American people and to the world the United States has conducted an operation that killed Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda. The success of the mission offers a prime example of where keeping a secret, even from the American public, pays off. But when does legitimate secrecy end and a cover-up begin? When does the American government flirt with criminal behavior? even in the name of national interest. There's a difference between a cover-up and citing national security in order to keep the American people safe. Cover-ups are used to cover up bad behavior and poor decisions, not to help the country, but to help the commander-in-chief. Another case of a top-secret mission that became a scandalous cover-up began in the early 1980s I do. under then-President Ronald Reagan. It involved the covert sale of arms to so-called moderates within the government of Iran in exchange for the Iranians' help in freeing seven Americans held hostage by a militant terrorist group. In the negotiations about the release of these hostages there was an indication on the part of the Iranian group that they needed certain weapons. They needed some arms. The Reagan administration then sought to provide the weapons that were needed by the Iranians. That began a process that we historically referred to now as arms for hostages. The problem was we delivered a plane full of military equipment and they didn't release the hostage. The United States comes back and goes, hey, wait a minute, where, where's the hostage? So, well, we need more. So another plane is delivered, and they release the hostage. We think, okay, this is working. The problem is right after they released one hostage, they took another. This happened three consecutive times before we figured out what they were doing. We were played for fools. But why was the Reagan administration so willing to sell arms to a nation openly hostile to the United States? The answer may lie 8,000 miles away. In the 
Central American country of Nicaragua, where a bloody war was taking place between the communist-controlled government and opposition forces known as Contras. Reagan believed strongly that the Contras deserved American funding and support. Unfortunately, any such funding had been banned by Congress. They passed a, what's called the Boland Amendment, which forbade any use of American funds in any way to the Contras. Blocked from spending official government money on the war in Nicaragua, the Reagan administration went to great lengths to find outside sources of funding to support the Contras. And so he went to one of his operatives, a guy named Ollie North, a bizarre little colonel, and he said, we've got to keep the Contras together, body and soul. North took that as marching orders, and he said, what a great idea. We'll take the funds that we get from the sale of weapons and give it to the Contras. There were those in the president's inner circle who argued that the elaborate scheme, while shady, was perfectly legal, at least in a technical sense. The arms to Iran would be sold, not by the United States, but by the Israelis. Residual money would, in turn, be used to secretly finance the Nicaraguan rebels. Oliver North was the central bureaucratic and operational manager for both the sale of arms to Iran and the illegal support and financing of the Contras. Either one of those things could have led to Ronald Reagan's impeachment. His aides all understood this. Right from the start, the Iran-Contra operation was organized as a cover-up. And a truly significant cover-up because it involved the creation of a rogue agency within the government itself. In November 1986, information about the Arms for Hostages scheme began to leak. So much so that an embarrassed President Reagan quickly set up a special review board to look into the matter. Oliver North and his activities would be the focus of most of the investigations, which was made more difficult when the Marine Lieutenant Colonel later admitted to shredding thousands of documents related to the case. In 1988, North was indicted on 16 felony counts and later convicted of three, aiding in the obstruction of Congress, shredding official documents, and accepting illegal payment. His convictions, however, were vacated since his testimony had been protected under an earlier grant of immunity. In the end, several high-ranking members of the Reagan administration were either indicted, convicted, or had their careers forever tarnished by the affair and the cover-up. But what about Ronald Reagan? Is it possible that the President of the United States was as innocent of the Iran-Contra scheme as he claimed? We did not, repeat, did not trade weapons or anything else for hostages. Nobody knows exactly what Reagan's role and responsibility was in Iran-Contra. Reagan claimed he didn't know anything about what was going on. Most historians don't believe that. This goes to the skill of Ronald Reagan as a politician and, and as an actor. Nobody can really prove what the president knew and when he knew it. The theory is put forward that this was some rogue operation going on that the president didn't know. That has not been my experience in the White House. I don't care who the president is. The information flows to the top. 